After a long delay that made it feel like it would never be released, I finally got a chance to sit down and watch Teen Wolf the movie, the long-awaited continuation of the show that got very awkwardly cancelled in 2017. I've already made a video on the show, you're totally welcome to go watch that if you haven't, but in it I did mention that a Teen Wolf movie was in the works and slated to be released in 2022. It was a huge announcement, they had done it. After a lot of campaigning from the fans and the actors alike, they finally managed to revive Teen Wolf for a film continuation. Six seasons and a movie, right? Everybody was excited. Hell, I was excited too. Teen Wolf was my shit when I was a teenager. I loved it. So like pretty much everyone else, I was down to get another go. Well friends, all I have to say is the result is probably the best example of the phrase, be careful what you wish for. Because yeah, after that initial excitement that followed the announcement, this movie quickly started to leave me a bit worry. The more we started to hear about the making of this project, the more I started to question the anticipation behind it. First off, like everyone else, the biggest disappointment came after the announcement that Dylan O'Brien would not be coming back for the movie. Obviously, Dylan and his character Styles were by far the best part of the show. People absolutely adore Styles, me included. He's genuinely one of the greatest teen TV characters of all time, so knowing he would be coming back was really, really unfortunate. But immediately after, the project was further tainted by an incident that really left me scratching my head. After we found out about Dylan O'Brien turning the movie down, it was also announced that Arden Cho, who played one of my favorite characters on the show, Kira Yukimura, had also turned down the movie and would not be coming back. However, unlike Dylan O'Brien, reports quickly follow that clarify that Arden had actually walked out of the project after she was only offered about a half of the pay of her co-stars. She refused to be treated like lesser than and so as a result she decided to walk away, after which she scored a massive role in Netflix's live action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender. Now for those who don't know, Arden show had already been done dirty by Teen Wolf and MTV during her time on the show. I talked about it in my last video. Here is a great character that was an amazing addition to the cast, but she was so brutally mistreated by the writers, and more specifically Arden Sho, who plays her. If you don't know the story, Kira was written out of the show at the end of season 5 out of nowhere, and it was revealed soon after that not only the audience was blindsided by her sudden departure, but Arden Sho herself was as well. She ended up releasing a YouTube video to confirm to fans of the show that she would not be coming back, but explained that she didn't really know why. Why? A lot of you guys have been asking about Teen Wolf and what's happening and I just want to say I love Kira Yukimura so much, I love the Yukimura family, but unfortunately it looks like we are wrapped up with Kira's storyline and she won't be coming back for season 6. There isn't always room for everyone and everyone's storylines and so I guess that was it. Um, you never know with Teen Wolf, I mean people might come back. Uh, it is what it is. She actually finished shooting season 5, expecting to be coming back for season 6. Her character was sent on a journey that teased her return with newfound abilities. But then, she just never returned, and so her story ends very abruptly and in a way that's not very satisfying. So the fact that they did this again with the movie is like really insulting. On the day the movie came out though, Arden Cho did an interview where she said she had no regrets about turning down the movie, and honestly, good for her. I wish her the best. And the following disappointment regarding the movie was simply the marketing campaign. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. The marketing for this movie was embarrassingly bad. I have no idea why Paramount Plus decided to go about it the way they did, but oh my god, whoever was in 
charge of this does not deserve their job. It's honestly one of the most bizarrely handled marketing campaigns I've seen in years. It was all scattered and strange. It looked like they didn't really know how to market the movie. They released trailers at very random times and they failed to generate any hype for a movie people had been campaigning for for like five years. And not only that, but the trailers themselves were so bad. The editing is so amateur-ish, it looks like those wonky fan edits you would see on TikTok and it makes the movie seem so unappealing and lame. The trailers for the show were infinitely better. They had weight, they made you want to watch. They were well executed and intriguing. Like, this is a clip from the trailer of season 5. Scott! You trusted him? You believed him? So where were you? <sighs> and this is a clip from the trailer of season three. <laughs> Who's that? Bro, I've already seen this season a few times, but just watching this makes me want to watch it again. The Teen Wolf trailers are freaking iconic, but for this movie, they made trailers that were so painfully underwhelming, boring, and flat. They look like trailers for a lame action movie from 2001. I could not believe how bad these trailers were. The Nikitsune has come to play a new game. You have to find her and stop her. Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. But the biggest worry for me came a few months later after the movie release date was pushed back to January 2023. See, while everything was underway, stories began to come out that this movie started production without really having a script. In fact, it was even confirmed by people working on the project that the script was being written in the middle of production. Like, basically, this movie was made in a rush and they didn't really have a story and so they were just kind of making things up as they went. Now that's a major red flag for any movie and that's probably why the news around the production were so confusing. Like early on after the movie was announced it had been confirmed that Tyler Hecklin wouldn't be reprising his role as Derek Hale in the film. He wasn't coming back, there were a bunch of headlines about it, people were really upset. But then like Two months after the start of production, a story broke on Variety that he was back. Like, out of nowhere. Like, so suddenly he's just in the movie. What? <coughs> you get it, I could go on all day about all the red flags surrounding this movie, but to make it short, the initial excitement quickly wore off because everything about this movie felt off. Everything surrounding the project was weirdly messy and I just didn't understand where they were going with it. And then the movie came out and I understood they weren't going anywhere with it. <laughs> Teen Wolf the movie is a giant mess. It's incoherent, nonsensical, it's stupid, it's incredibly lazy, it's just mediocre and way too long. And the story is so full of plot holes and so full of elements that destroy Teen Wolf as a franchise that it's honestly a little insulting to the fans. All of that paired with the fact that this movie is so needlessly bloated. And this is gonna sound weird, but I'm gonna explain throughout the video, so bear with me. The biggest issue with Teen Wolf the movie that explains most of its problems moving forward is simply that this movie is not trying to be a Teen Wolf movie. It is trying to be Teen Wolf season 7 but crammed into a two and a half hour movie and it is 
a mess. We're gonna talk about all this, but before we do that, I just want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Tyler Posey's Dignity. <laughs> I'm kidding, there's no sponsor, let's break the movie down. So Teen Wolf the movie takes place about 15 years after the events of the show. The story kicks off in Japan where a mysterious hooded man walks in a bar where Liam is working. Liam is Scott McCall's beta and a popular character from the original show's 2.0 cast, and immediately I just have to say, this movie starts so abruptly, it's a little funny. That's literally about 30 seconds into the movie. Anyways, the guy walks in and he's looking for a jar because he wants to free the Nogitsune. For the quick backstory, the Nogitsune is a thousand year old evil fox spirit, a powerful and violent trickster that feeds off of chaos, strife, and pain. At the end of Teen Wolf season three, the Nogitsune is defeated by Scott and the pack, but since it's an invincible spirit that can't be killed, they trapped it in a a jar made of wood that comes from a magical tree called the Nemeton. And now, 15 years later, a mysterious man comes to get the jar and free the spirit to cause chaos once again. Now, here's the first thing I don't understand. Why was the jar in a bar in Japan? with fucking Liam. And this character who is clearly not here as a replacement for Kira because Arden showed they didn't come back. Why there? They weren't even trying to hide it. It was just sitting on a shelf in a public space. And why is it that they seem to be waiting for this man? It looked like they ambushed him. There were guys ready with guns and stuff in the whole bar. Were they expecting someone to try and steal it that very night? Was it all planned out? I'm asking because the movie never tells us and it seems to be completely random. Like we don't know what's actually happening in this scene. It's very vague and the movie never addresses it. Who are these guys with guns in the bar? Are they mercenaries? Do they work for Liam or discount Kira? This is so weirdly confusing. We're not even three minutes into the movie and already it's not making sense and there are plot holes the movie will never care to explain. Anyway, so a fight erupts and um... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not a gun person, but I'm pretty sure that's not how bullets work. After a quick struggle, the hooded Death Eater gets the jar and frees the Nogitsune, and they make a deal to get revenge on Scott McCall, end of the prologue. We are now four minutes into the movie, and already I have a number of issues with it. The first one being... The Nogitsune. The return of the Nogitsune is a little cringe and unnecessary. It feels desperate more than anything else, very in tune with Teen Wolf's undying attempts at recapturing the magic of season 3B, which it never managed to do. Bringing back the most popular villain just because it was the most popular villain is unoriginal and lazy. And I would like to remind you that Teen Wolf the show ended with an undefeated villain that escaped the heroes. And the show hints in the finale that she's still out there and that Scott and company are gonna have to face her again someday. So you'd think this was gonna be the story of the movie because it's literally the show's cliffhanger. But instead, the movie ignores the second half of the show and serves more as a direct sequel to season 3B while cherry picking the elements of future seasons it wants to keep. And I'm just... Why? I get that Jeff Davis is obsessed with 3B and has never managed to do something as good, but this is so weirdly contrived. But anyway, so then we're reintroduced to Scott McCall, the protagonist of Teen Wolf. What do you guys call him again? The Alpha. Right. Like a dog. No. Like a wolf. Oh my god, the dialogue in this movie, I swear to god. Scott is now an adult, he still works as a veterinarian, and he hasn't changed at all. That's a thing with pretty much everyone in this movie. Despite the fact that 15 years have gone by since the show's finale, every single one of them is the exact 
same. They pretty much look the same. They act the same. They're written the same. Like this movie could have been taking place a week after the finale and it would have made more sense because nothing has changed. So Scott is living a quiet life until one day when he's visited by Chris Argent, the father of his dead girlfriend, Allison. And this is where the plot of the movie kicks in if we can even call it that. This movie doesn't really have a story if you think about it, but we'll get into that later. And as soon as Argent shows up, things get way too dumb way too quickly. The kickoff of the plot is really incoherent and really forced. The Bardo thing leading Arjun to believe Allison is still alive in some form somewhere is a little stupid, and him setting the stakes for the story by saying he has a feeling the answers are back in Beacon Hills is such a lazy plot device to get the characters back to the town. But the funniest part is that when he is asked what they can do about this Allison theory, Argent simply says there is a ritual of some kind. And he also says this ritual has to be done at the next full moon or it can never be done again. Huh? What? This is how we're setting up the plot with this vague ass story thread based on a hunch that is based on a theory that is based on a dream? We are 14 minutes into this movie and already nobody is making any sense. We're talking about dangerous rituals thousands of years old. There are going to be repercussions. How do you know that? Arjun just said it's a ritual quote of some kind and the only detail he gives about it is that he doesn't really have any details about it. We don't even know what that supposed ritual does. So what are you talking about? I'm sorry, but this is just such a bad start to the movie. And can we just talk about how little sense this whole ritual thing makes? That has to be one of the most poorly constructed storylines in all of Teen Wolf. And trust me, that's saying something. I kind of glossed over it, so let me go back. Let me just give you the quick breakdown of how the first act of the movie goes and how it makes no sense. So Arjun says he had a vision of Allison where the word Bardo came up. Bardo is apparently a word that describes a state between life and death or something like that. So based on that and based on that alone, Arjun says that Allison is probably still alive, like in limbo between the realm of the living and the other side. Now keep in mind that it's just a hunch. He's just assuming. He's just kinda guessing that. I know we all die. I'm not pretending to know what happens next. But if there was something after this life, some next step, I don't think she made it. This entire plot line rests on the idea that Argent just sort of imagines that maybe Allison's soul couldn't pass on to the other side. Which, by the way, I believe is Teen Wolf's first ever mention of an afterlife, so that's incredibly random and out of left field. Then, Arjun says the only thing there is to do about it is a ritual he doesn't really know anything about. And then he proceeds to never explain what the ritual is or what it does. All he says is that the answers are in Beacon Hills and they have to go there and make stuff happen on the next full moon. And again, he says it's their only chance. If they miss this full moon, it's never gonna happen. How does he know that? Never explain. Why is this the only moment they can save Allison? Never explain. So Scott makes his way to Beacon Hills and Lydia meets him there. Yeah, Lydia is here by the way. It doesn't really matter because she barely does anything in this movie, but whatever. She's here. And when she shows up, she just randomly says that they need to gather a handful of dirt from the ground where Allison died? I... okay, why? We don't know. Is this part of the ritual mentioned by Argent? Couldn't tell ya. She just says that, and then they just 
do it. And I know it's not Argent that told them to do that off screen because they meet up with Argent right after that and he says gathering the dirt was step two according to Lydia. And when he asks her what the next step is, Lydia says she doesn't know. But Argent also doesn't know. So like, what are they doing? What is currently going on in this movie? Because I would like to remind you that up to this point, Argent still has not explained what they are trying to do in the first place, and he never does. We have no idea what the characters are trying to accomplish right now. It's never told to us. We know they're trying to quote, help Allison, but what does that mean? Help her how? Help her to do what? We don't know what they're doing, and it looks like they don't really know either, and their plan doesn't even make any sense. Argent says that gathering the dirt was step two, according According to Lydia, okay, but what was step one? You didn't do anything before that, so what was step one? What is going on? Was step one going to Beacon Hills? Is that part of the ritual? This movie makes no sense. Oh my god. Oh, and that's not all, because a second later, Jackson shows up. Oh yeah, um, Jackson is in this movie as well. You'll probably forget by the time the credits roll, but he was there. Jackson shows up and he just randomly starts playing with a bunch of papers that Lydia drew on while having some weird banshee shit happen. He literally just walks in and immediately grabs the papers and he starts rearranging them like in Stranger Things and discovers that Lydia's incoherent drawings were actually a puzzle that create a larger picture of the Nematon, the magical tree from the show. Mind you, nobody asked Jackson to do that. He doesn't even know why he's here and what is going on. He had no idea the papers were a puzzle. He had no way to know. He didn't even know Lydia drew these things. He just walked into the room, grabbed random papers out of nowhere, and just solved a puzzle nobody knew was even there and nobody asked him to look at. He literally just does it because the story needs him to. And now that we have the picture from the puzzle, they think the next step is going to the Nematon. But they don't know how to get to the Nematon for some reason. It's never explained why they suddenly can't find it anymore. They were there more often than they were at school when they were teenagers. So because they can't find it, Scott and Lydia call Melissa. Malia, whose only character development in that 15 year time jump is that she is now sleeping with Parrish. Oh good, Parrish is here. Yay. Well. <laughs> okay. So Scott and Lydia call Malia so that she can use her senses to find the Nemeton? I think? I'm just sort of guessing here because it's never actually explained why they're meeting with Malia. They just sort of meet her in the woods and they just start walking. Which, if this is to find the Nemeton, why can't Scott do that? I know Scott is a wolf and Malia is a coyote, but as far as we've been told, they have the exact same powers, except Scott is like a million times more powerful because he's a true alpha. And again, it's never explained why they need Malia to find the tree. They just kind of meet her and they start walking in the woods with her. Like they barely exchange two words. Oh, I missed you. I missed you too. No, you didn't. Okay, I wanted to. It's good to see you. It's kind of awkward to see you. But whatever, Malia can't find the Nemeton either for whatever reason. But conveniently, at that very moment, Scott realizes that someone is following them. And it turns out to be... Eli Hale, the 15 year old son of Derek Hale. Oh yeah, Derek is back and he has a kid. 
Fuck his kid, I don't like him. He's a bad character and he's really annoying. But anyways, he shows up and he says, Hey, I just so happen to know where to find the tree you're looking for. So he takes them there. Quick reminder, uh, we still don't know what they're trying to do. We don't know what their goal is here. They keep saying they have to do this. But the movie literally never tells you what this is. As far as they know, Allison is dead, and she's been dead for 15 years. So they're not here to bring her back to life. That literally happens by accident, and they don't even think it's real. But they never say what exactly they're here for. And I just, ugh, I fucking hate this. I hate that the movie is never capable of telling us what the characters are actually doing. They're just running around, doing whatever, and we just have to accept that as a story, but there is no clear goal. There are no stakes because there is no story. I'm sorry, I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but it's driving me insane. Like, what the hell is this plot? They came back to Beacon Hills to perform a ritual for Allison, all based on Argent assuming she might be in limbo, which they're not even sure exists. Nobody knows what the ritual is. Nobody knows how to perform that ritual. And nobody knows what the ritual will do if they succeed. The entire first act of this film is a giant plot hole. It's trying to convince you that things are happening, but nothing is going on. Oh, and before we carry on with the Nemeton thing, it's worth mentioning that there is a random scene in the middle of that where Argent has a conversation with Deaton, and Deaton suspects Argent of being possessed by the Nogitsune. So he starts giving him some riddles to solve, and for some reason, Argent can't handle it. They sort of fight while solving riddles, and apparently the riddles are like hurting Argent, and suddenly, a firefly flies out of his mouth. What does this mean? Did you guess it's never explained and it has no impact on the story moving forward? Because you would be correct. Good job. Good for you. Here's a Kit Kat. This weird ass sequence just happens in the middle of other things happening. And then the movie carries on as if it never happened. And it's never mentioned again. We know the fireflies are a sign of the Nogitsune's presence because it happened with Styles in season three. That's how the Nogitsune kind of possesses people. But here it does nothing. Argent is the same before and after that scene. It's literally here for no reason. You could think this is trying to say that Argent was possessed by the Nogitsune and the Nogitsune used him to bring everybody back to Beacon Hills with this fake bullshit about Allison, uh, but no, because he was right about Allison and she does end up coming back to life. So that can be it. I, I just... Ugh. Did I mention this movie makes no sense? Anyway, so back to the woods, Scott, Lydia, and Malia are finally at the Nemeton, and they don't know what they're supposed to do, again, because it's never explained to them or to us. So, out of nowhere, Lydia decides to present the tree with the sword that killed Allison. Which, first of all, how do they have that sword? Allison was killed by an Oni, and these motherfuckers disappear with their weapons, their spirits. They're not people, so how do they have that sword? Anyway, Lydia presents the tree with the sword that killed Allison, and suddenly, the handful of dirt Scott gathered earlier flies out of his hand into the tree, and then the sword flies into it as well. Then there starts to be some very powerful wind, the tree starts to glow, and then boom, Allison comes back to life. Her body just materializes out of nothing, and she's just there. She's alive. And I just... What? You're telling me these idiots just performed the exact ritual they needed to revive her by accident? What? <laughs> when I tell you I busted out laughing at this scene, I actually had to pause it because I was 
baffled at how little sense it made. Like, seriously, who wrote the- Oh, wait. I forgot. Oh, and by the way, I would like to quickly remind you that the movie just started. We're still at the beginning. All of this brainless nonsense takes place in the first like 35 minutes of the movie. And this thing is two and a half hours long. So we got a long way to go. And this is already so bad. Nothing makes sense. The entire story so far is just plot hole on top of plot hole and it only gets worse as it goes, believe it or not. And this is where we gotta talk about Allison. As established, the way Allison comes back is completely random and nonsensical and honestly kinda lame and again insulting to the audience's intelligence. And this is how dumb it is. Allison is brought back to life, but she's unconscious. So Scott, Lydia, and Malia decide to bring her to the hospital. But just a few minutes after she's admitted to the ER, Allison suddenly wakes up and escapes. Now, she's completely disoriented. She doesn't remember anything. She doesn't know where she is or who she is. But then she randomly starts hearing her father's voice from like season one as he tells her about their family of werewolf hunters. Our sons are trained to be soldiers, daughters, to be leaders. So now she just goes back to being a hunter. But like she doesn't remember anything. All she knows is she has to kill werewolves. I, okay, sure. And then the Nogitsune finds her very randomly, might I add, and it takes the appearance of Allison's mother and it convinces her to kill Scott and Derek Hale. I'm not sure I understand why she falls for it because it's not like the Nogitsune immediately appears to her as her mom. He appears to her as the Nogitsune and then randomly turns into her mom and she just believes it. So now that's the plot of the movie for the second act. Allison wants to kill Scott and Derek. And I gotta say, of all the things they could have done with her character, I genuinely cannot bring myself to understand why they chose to bring her back the way they did. See, the trailer's gonna lead you to believe Allison was brought back by the Nogitsune as a sort of mercenary that serves him. And that would make so much more sense. It would make so much more sense for the Nogitsune to bring back a zombie killing Allison to mess with Scott. That's exactly the type of insane shit the Nogitsune would do. But instead, she comes back back accidentally. You could say the Nogitsune orchestrated it by creating fake visions to bring everybody back to Beacon Hills, but that doesn't make sense because, again, it wasn't a trick and it was hardly orchestrated. I would have understood if making them believe they could bring her back to life was a ploy to make them return to the town, but they actually do bring her back to life and by accident. If this is what they were going for, it would mean the Nogitsune plan entirely relied on Scott and company to be fucking morons who act on incredibly far-fetched assumptions because there is no way this should have worked and it doesn't make sense. But then again, if Allison really was sending a signal from Limbo for her friends to help her come back, then why is that never mentioned once she comes back? She never talks about being in Limbo. That thread completely disappears from the plot as soon as she comes back to life. And as far as the story is concerned, she was just dead. So the entire first act of the movie is completely invalid. Oh my god, this movie is so frustrating. Allison's whole bloodline feels completely half-assed. You can tell they did not think this through even a little bit. Even the circumstances around her relationships are completely illogical. Allison comes back to life after being killed at age 17, I think. So even if 15 years have gone by, technically she's still a teenager. Except it's odd to see because Crystal Reed is almost 40 years old now. She's way too old to play a teenager. But even if they decided to break the logic and make her an adult physically, 
mentally, she's still 17 years old because she was dead for 15 years. So it's really weird to watch this movie attempt to rekindle her teenage romance with Scott, who is now well into his 30s. I just, I don't understand why she's back. I genuinely believe they would never do something this cheap, and so I stupidly assume that her being resurrected would not be permanent, that it would either be a trick from the Nogitsune or something in that vein that would justify her not actually staying alive by the end of the movie. But no, she's back, and she's back for good, which takes away so much of the weight from her death in season 3 of the show. And if you've seen my other Teen Wolf video, you know I like Allison a lot as a character, but that doesn't mean I want her to come back to life just like that in such an incoherent story. Like, it doesn't do anything for her, it actually kind of ruins her character. I mean, she's not the worst character in the movie, but it's still really disappointing to see how much they ruin her in this. Who are you? It's me, Scott. Scott who? Get the fuck out of here. And it's not only the returning characters that are awful here. The new ones too. Discount Kira Yukimura is so incredibly lame as a character. The actress playing her is really bad in this role. Sorry to her, maybe she's a good actress, I've never seen her in anything else, but it was a bit distracting in this movie. And what was more distracting is how obvious it is that this character was supposed to be Kira. It's almost embarrassing how it comes across. She barely speaks the entire movie. We learn nothing about her. I'm not even sure we know what her name is. Nobody really talks to her except for Liam. She's only used very fleetingly in some of the movie's worst action sequence, which, by the way, the action sequences in this movie are really bad. It's kind of insane. The editing is really odd and the sound mixing is incredible incredibly off. There are some scenes where you can't really hear anything except for the sound effects of the swords that are way too loud. Like it looks and sounds like the scenes were not fully completed. And it's like that throughout the entire movie. Some shots straight up look like they were not finished. There is some truly horrific green screen. The CGI feels like PlayStation 2 graphics. Like, again, it just feels unfinished. I just, this whole movie feels so half-assed, man. Like, what's happening? How did this happen? Who let this happen? I'm tired, man. This thing is a nightmare. And why is Jackson here? What, what do detectives do anyway? Do they like go to the scene of the crime and detect something? Oh my god, why is he here? He doesn't do anything! Even in situations of peril, he's incompetent! Jackson is a freaking canima! He even has a line in the movie where he brags about having claws and a tail that can poison people or whatever. But we never see him transform in this movie! He's literally useless! He gets shot and he stays on the ground in pain for the rest of the movie and then we just don't see him again! It's it's so painfully clear that Jeff didn't know what to do with him. So again, why is he here? This whole movie feels like Jeff Davis picked up the phone and called everyone in the Teen Wolf cast and asked them to come back for a movie. And he was just like, I have no idea what we're doing, but whoever says yes, we'll just figure it out later, I guess. Like he didn't actually have a story to tell. He didn't know what to do with the characters. He just hoped that it would somehow work out magically if the cast was back. And seeing what this movie turned out to be, I'm honestly glad he didn't get to bring the two best characters back, because he probably would have ruined them too. Anyways, the movie starts dragging on in the second act, again making me question why this thing needed to be two and a half hours long. It still doesn't make sense. Allison is told by the new Gitsune to track down Scott and kill him, and then kill the rest of the pack, but also, Allison wants to kill Derek. But instead of doing 
all this, she spends like 20 minutes going after Derek's kid, who she has no reason to be hunting. At first, I thought she was trying to attack him so that Scott would come to his rescue and she could fight him, but that doesn't make sense because Allison has no idea who Eli is. She doesn't know that's Derek's son. As far as she knows, he's just a random kid. Why is she after him? She has no way of knowing that Scott would come after him to protect him. Ugh, anyways, whatever. Inside of all of that, she almost kills Derek, who is so nerfed in this movie, he might as well not be a werewolf anymore. Then Allison starts fighting Scott, but Scott doesn't want to fight her, so he spends literally over 20 minutes of the runtime just being like, Wait, I just want to talk. Let me explain. Please stop. You don't understand. Never actually says what he wants to say. The whole time he's just like, please stop. You have to hear me out. You don't understand. Fantastic job, Jeff. This is definitely how you build good tension in a movie. Bravo, dude. Then nothing really happens for a very long time. A bunch of characters are captured by the Nogitsune. And by the way, just for the quick reminder, uh, we are now an hour and 40 minutes into this movie, and we still don't really know what the Nogitsune's plan is. This whole time, he's just kind of there. He wants Scott dead. Okay, but what is he doing exactly? Things are just sort of happening. There's no rhyme or reason to any of it, but again, you're just supposed to accept it as a story. Oh, and also, uh, in case you didn't know, Lydia and Jackson are in this movie, and um, they needed to contribute somehow. So the mysterious hooded guy from the beginning uh, finds them, and he unmasks himself to them for some reason. They treat the reveal of this hooded villain like a big thing, and then it turns out to be... Oh. Um. I'm sorry. Does, does anybody remember this guy? Oh. He's a teacher from a B plot of season three that was essentially a plot hole. That's that's your big villain reveal. OK, sure, whatever. Honestly, from how this entire movie has been handled, I'm pretty sure this villain is the one that's revealed because it's the only actor that accepted to come back. But OK, cool good for him and now this is when the movie really devolves into something so bafflingly bad that i struggle to believe this movie wasn't meant to be a joke when i told you this movie gets worse as it goes trust me I wasn't lying. The third act of Teen Wolf the movie is something that will forever break my brain. I cannot count the amount of stupid moments in these last 25 minutes. Peter being convinced that Allison is an illusion. The awkward speech about the divine move. Scott having to play a game of lacrosse with teenagers to outrun the Nogitsune doing something that's never explained but somehow it's really urgent that they win a game of lacrosse very fast because apparently people will die but we don't know how or why i just uh, this movie is so fucking stupid What is going on, man? Oh, by the way, Peter gets poisoned with Wolfsbane in this scene, but then he's never healed from it? So, like, he should be dead right now. But no, he's not. It's never addressed. I don't know. I guess the movie forgot about that, too. But this is when the third act of the movie goes into full gear, and it is some of the most impressively mediocre stuff Teen Wolf has ever given us. Let me just explain to you how much this third act makes zero 
sense. So after Scott finds himself playing a game of lacrosse with teenage kids in order to end the game faster and evacuate the stadium, for no reason might I add, we never find out what the danger is for the people in the stadium, some bullshit happens with Peter and then a new scene begins and Scott and Allison just appear in the Nogitsune's world. They're just there. The scene starts with them already here. We don't know how they got here. Allison touched some bad CGI smoke that appears out of nowhere. So I guess that's it. But Scott wasn't even there. He was in a completely different part of the stadium. He just appears with her where the plot is because the story needs him to. Also, Eli is there as well. I don't know why, but he is. Then the Oni ninjas appear as well, and they start fighting Scott and Allison. Meanwhile, Lydia is still at the stadium with the weird teacher and an incapacitated Jackson who was shot and is just being useless on the floor. Keep in mind he's a Kanema and should be able to heal in a few seconds, but <laughs> what is lore consistency, am I right? They're all watching the fight happening via a truly hilarious looking CGI portal, and for some reason, Jackson keeps telling Lydia to use her banshee scream. Oh yeah, it's mentioned very briefly that Lydia hasn't used her banshee scream in years. We'll get to that later. Jackson is imploring her to use her banshee scream again to help Allison. And um, what? Why? Let me just remind you that Lydia is a banshee. A banshee screams when somebody is about to die. Then, in season 5 of Teen Wolf, Lydia learns to use her scream to create a shockwave that essentially makes it a weapon. Okay, but Lydia is not actually there. They're watching the fight through a portal. So why is Jackson telling Lydia to use her banshee scream to help Allison? How would that help her? He doesn't know what that would do. He has no way to know that her scream would give Allison her memories back. That's never been a thing before. So why is he telling her to do that? That makes no sense. Allison is alive. Your best friend is alive and she's out there fighting for her life. Don't lose her again, she'll hear you. He keeps saying that if she screams, Allison will hear her. Okay, so what? How does that help her? This movie is so dumb. Anyway, so Lydia uses her banshee scream and for some reason that's never explained, it gives Allison her memories back and now she remembers everything. Okay. Cool. For the record, that doesn't do anything for the rest of the movie. She just knows who she is now. Awesome. Then, the Nogitsune appears and he says that he's gonna kill everyone. And then, out of nowhere, Scott randomly tells the Nogitsune that he would win the game if Allison kills him and he dies in her arms because she died in his arms 15 years ago which huh nobody told him to say that he just made that up <laughs> and then the nogitsune is just like oh Okay, sure, all right, well, if Allison shoots you dead in the heart with arrows, I'll let the others go. So Scott tells Allison to kill him, and she just does it. <laughs> she shoots him in the heart three times, and he collapses on the ground. Then the Nugitsune asks Scott what sound a wolf makes when it's about to die, and Scott says that he can't tell him because he's not ready to die yet. And then the arrows in his heart just disappear and he stands back up fox fire <laughs> why did he do that <laughs> what was the point of it was that supposed to be a trick because that didn't accomplish anything 
Yeah. And I love that Scott gives him this cocky look like, ha, gotcha. But bitch, you didn't do anything. You didn't save lives or whatever. You're just not dead. And now he's gonna kill all of you. Whatever, Allison shoots the Nugget's name in the head. It doesn't do anything because obviously. And then a bunch of other characters randomly appear and the final battle begins. What is that? Silver! You motherfucker. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> what is this movie? Uh, whatever. They defeat the Oni with Silver, and now there's only the Nogitsune left. And then, in the most random twist of all time, the Nogitsune suddenly says that Scott turned him into a werewolf 15 years ago because they initially defeated him by Scott biting him because, like, a fox can't be a wolf, blah, 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 some bullshit lore. And he starts undoing the bandages around his face, and you... You know what? I'll just I'll just let you watch it. No. No. This has to be a joke. This has to be a joke. I refuse to believe this is the Teen Wolf movie we got. Like, fundamentally in my heart, I cannot believe this movie is real. And this is it. I can't believe it. The final fight of this movie. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. What? happened how did we get here how did it get this bad this is genuinely one of the worst movies i've seen in the last few years and i saw morbius last year it's insane it's like it feels like they didn't have a script and we're just making things up as the oh wait I forgot. No, but jokes aside, this is astonishingly bad. Even by Teen Wolf standards. It looks atrocious. It's, it's just so bad. Like, th the entire third act of this movie left me genuinely stunned. Hold him! You gotta hold him! You can't! You both burn up with him! <laughs> I just... I don't have the words. I don't have the words. Anyway, the battle eventually ends. It still makes no sense. Oh, Derek dies, by the way. Yeah. He really didn't need to, but okay, sure, whatever. He decides to hold the Nugitsune still while Parrish unleashes Hellfire to kill it. Um, but a second ago, Parrish was holding the Nugitsune by himself. So he could have just burned his ass down then. But no, we needed a Derek heroic death scene to set up his son's potential spin-off. They try really hard to make it sad too, but it was so unnecessary and stupid because he really did not need to die. So it's impossible to feel anything about it. It's just hollow and kind of boring. Nobody looks that sad about him dying too. Everyone just kind of stares and that's it. So the Nugitsune dies, and Derek dies with him, and I guess that's how the battle ends. And then the movie ends, and it just kind of forgets to end all the storylines it started. Believe it or not, we don't even get to see Lydia and Allison reunite. Like, they straight up don't show you that scene. You get one shot where you see them hug, but that's it. They don't talk to each other the whole movie. Not once. We don't even get to see Allison talk with her dad aside from a brief scene earlier in the third act. Like, this movie doesn't give a single shit about Allison interacting with anyone but Scott. The story just has a huge boner for these two getting back together, but she was so much more than Scott's love interest. I'm sorry, but the fact that we don't get a scene where she reunites with Lydia and they get to talk after 15 years of her being dead is mind-blowing to me. But that weird gap is not limited to Allison. Liam and his best friend Mason do not exchange any words 
this whole movie. I'm not kidding. They're both in the movie, but they don't have a single scene together. They never talk to each other throughout the entire runtime. Scott and his mom barely exchange two words the whole movie. Jackson is as useless as ever. The movie also spends a lot of time building up a relationship between Malia and Parrish for some reason, and they keep hinting that their hookups will turn into a full-blown romance. You're giving me that look again. What look? The look. What are you talking about? There's no look. There's a look. What look? The relationship look. If we don't die tonight, we can talk about the look. Huh. Then I'm definitely not dying tonight. <laughs> but then... Nothing happens! I'm not joking, this plotline just doesn't have a resolution. The movie ends, and it just forgot about them. Peter Hale gets a cool introduction sequence with a cheesy one-liner as he stands in the shadows, but then he doesn't do anything for the rest of the movie. And he's probably the most connected character out of everyone. Derek is his nephew, but they don't interact at all in this story. Eli is his great-nephew, they also never talk. And Malia is his daughter, and I believe they only exchange a couple lines with each other in one scene. He doesn't even have an arc in the movie. Just like Jackson, Peter shows up in the movie, he's being an asshole the whole way through, and then he doesn't even get an exit. He just disappears from the movie. He doesn't even react to Derek's death. That's his nephew! It's arguably the person he's closest to. And now he's dead. Oh, and I feel sad to say that I still don't know why Lydia is here. The fact that Dylan O'Brien was not coming back had to come with an explanation for why Lydia didn't return to Beacon Hills with Styles. So they come up with this whole ridiculous backstory for their breakup. Apparently, Apparently. Lydia left Styles because she had a dream where she saw Styles dying in a car crash, but because she had the dream several times, she couldn't tell if it was a premonition. So to make sure it doesn't come true because she was in the dream with Styles as he died, she decided to leave him. Okay. As you know, I'm not big on shipping. I really don't care. I also never particularly gave a shit about Styles and Lydia as a couple. I talked about all this in my video on the show. But I really feel bad for the Stadia fans out there. Julia Cutney, my dear friend, thoughts and prayers. Your pain must be real right now. But oh my god. God! Fans waited six seasons to see these two together. And when the show ends, they finally get together, but the fans never really got to see them being a couple, which upset a lot of people. And now, this movie comes out and confirms that the fan favorite ship broke up off screen only because one of the two actors didn't want to come back. You know, the fact that I think the fans are gonna really wanna know in the world of Beacon Hills, like where is Styles? Lydia and Styles was such a big part of the show. I love that Jeff addresses that and I do, it did feel like a legitimate reason to me of why they're not together anymore and it's a really sad reason. Um, but that bittersweet combo, I think it's gonna have the fans reeling a little bit. Bittersweet? But where's the sweet part? If you've seen my original video, you know that I hate the ending of the Teen Wolf show. Like it's a really bad final season and the ending sucks ass. But somehow this movie feels like they ruined an already terrible ending. How do you do this? All the characters are ruined beyond what my wildest imagination could have come up with. Oh, and then, obviously, because otherwise it's not funny, the movie itself ends by attempting to set up a future movie or series with Derek's son as the main character, and with Scott and Allison becoming his adopted parents, I guess? But like, quick question. Where is his mom? Derek was a single dad, but Eli's mother is never brought up. She's not mentioned once. We have no idea if she's alive, dead, and if she's not dead, we don't know why she's out of the picture. Like, what's going on? It's just, 
I, I don't know who this movie was made for or what it was trying to accomplish. Most of the movie is made of desperate attempts at fan service. That's literally all it does. It doesn't even have a cohesive story. It's just trying to throw fan service at you for two and a half hours. So much so that it feels like this movie was made exclusively for diehard obsessive fans of the show, most of whom watch the show as teenagers and are now adults. And yet, this show tries to build a new protagonist for what could be the future of the franchise, as if this movie was made to introduce the universe to a potential new audience. But it miserably fails at providing fan service for old fans, and it also fails at being an open door for newcomers. So who is this movie made for? It ends up being a brainless flick that is only obsessed with paying homage to itself, which is really lame and pretentious. The story is half-baked, most of the characters that are here have no reason to be in the story, and it's really awkward to watch them interact if they interact at all. I genuinely think this movie is spitting in the face of longtime fans. It's insulting. And the worst part is, this thing is insulting enough as a final epilogue to the show, but it's not a final epilogue. Some of the cast have talked about how Jeff is aiming for this movie to be the start of a new franchise. They want this atrocity to have a sequel. I, d I don't know what to say. I genuinely do not have the words. I cannot believe this movie exists. I cannot believe this is what it turned out to be. This feels like a sick joke made to spite the very loyal fan base of Teen Wolf. I don't believe for a second that this is Jeff Davis's supposed love letter to the fandom. Anyway, I am out of words and out of energy, so I'm just gonna moonwalk myself out of this one. This movie is horrible, it's shameful, it's embarrassing. I feel bad for everybody involved, you can totally skip it. I have no idea how six years of efforts turned into this. But it's still better than the Gossip Girl reboot though, okay bye! Weak boys will get offended hey, You're staring blankly You don't look so happy Your eyes are so empty Bitch, you make me angry